I'll be looking at how one manages quality in the ART laboratory. The webinar will introduce concepts of quality assurance and quality control in the context of ART, drawing on international guidelines. And I'll be considering factors such as staffing, competencies, traceability, and managing risks and adverse incidents. I'll first address what we mean by quality management, then go on and talk about total quality management in the assisted conception setting, and at the end, uh, just offer up a brief summary. So what do we mean uh, by quality management? Definitions vary a little, but this is taken from the website of the Association of Project Managers, and it's a good example, uh, I believe. And it states that quality management is a discipline for ensuring that outputs or services and the processes by which these are delivered meet stakeholders' requirements and are fit for purpose. It also um, suggests that quality management has four components. Quality planning, which describes the processes and metrics that will be used and should be agreed with relevant stakeholders to ensure that their expectations for quality are correctly identified. Then there's quality assurance, which is the overarching approach that provides confidence that processes and services are being well managed are consistent or standardised and are performed by personnel with the right skills, attitudes and resources. Quality control uh, consists of inspection, testing and measurement that confirms that outputs actually meet specification, are fit for purpose and meet stakeholder expectations. In other words, Quality control tests whether acceptance criteria have or indeed have not been met. The overall aim of quality management is to first of all ensure that specifications and standards are met, but just as importantly, it is to seek areas in which uh, the laboratory can improve. Shown here is the quality cycle whereby one measures the performance of the systems in use and then targets where improvements could potentially be made. Again, you can see variations on this theme, but in essence, the four actions are plan. Here, the possible opportunities for change are first identified and the changes planned and agreed. Then there is do. This is the part of the process in which the tested changes that have been agreed are then piloted and data collected to measure the effect of those changes. Then there is check and here data analysis and review is undertaken which reflects on the impact of the tested changes and then decides whether those changes were positive, neutral or indeed negative. And finally act which is the implementer, implementation of changes if they're deemed useful and positive. And thereafter, the cycle would simply begin again, so driving a process of gradual and continual improvement. Of course, quality management can be assessed more formally by application of standards such as those published by the International Organization for Standardization, ISO. And I've listed some pertinent ones for IVF labs here. Though it's unlikely that an IVF lab would seek certification for ISO 17025, 31000 or 14644, there are some relevant sections that would, would pertain to an IVF setting. It's much more likely, however, that a laboratory would have certification to ISO 9001 as a general standard for quality management systems that might be applied across the whole unit or to ISO 15189, which is specific to medical laboratories. ISO 15189 is currently under review, but the 2012 version is still applicable. As indicated, it deals with requirements for quality and competence across medical laboratories. So it's not specific to ART or indeed any particular lab discipline. And whilst perhaps 
not readily interpreted for medically assisted reproduction, the general aims of confirming and recognising competence for lab users, regulators and accrediting bodies can be useful and indeed has been implemented uh, across some uh, IVF centres. More commonly perhaps, ISO 9001 can be applied to the IVF centre since it's a universal standard and the requirements are generic and applicable to all types of organisations. This standard assesses the quality management system and shows that the organisation meets the needs of users in a consistent way. User satisfaction is evaluated, as are the processes for continual improvement. We know that this has been successfully introduced and indeed ALPA and colleagues reported in 2013 how they used ISO quality control and the 9001 standards uh, to contribute to developing their service. Now let's move on to looking at total quality management in assisted conception. Here I'm going to use the ESHRA revised guidelines for good practice as a helpful starting point and I know these standards uh, and these guidelines may not be uh, globally applicable, but they're a useful starting point that will guide us through um, how quality management impacts on the IVF laboratory in particular. I've highlighted here some of the key elements of the guidelines that pertain to quality management. And I've highlighted in blue um, some particular key words that we'll revisit during the progress through this presentation. By way of background, it's interesting that ESHRA, the ESHRA guidelines um, recommend that a clinical embryologist is responsible for quality management within the laboratory. Though, of course, the overall quality manager would not necessarily be a laboratory person. The guidelines cover a wide range of relevant topics, including databases that allow for KPI extraction and statistical analysis for risk assessments and preventive actions, uh, for systems for non-compliance, emergencies, errors, adverse events, near misses and complaints, as well as the choosing of objective and relevant KPIs and particip participation in internal quality control and external quality insurance. That's backed up, of course, by the annual review of the quality management system and audits, both internal and external. But the key words highlighted here, responsibilities, competencies, SOPs, and so on, we'll now take through in order um, to highlight quality management in assisted conception laboratories. So the first word um, refers to defining responsibilities. This is a key part of quality management. People must understand their role within the wider organization and know to whom they report and who reports to them. This is an old example from my um, uh, work previously. This organisational chart supports the structure needed for effective decision making and also dealing with adverse events, depending on the nature, scale and impact. In addition, each person should have an up to date job description which sets out what is expected of them and what they can do and maybe even what they're not able to do since this defines their scope of practice no one should be asked to perform any activity in which they are not competent and have not been adequately trained of course it's also up to the individual to, to make clear that they uh, cannot undertake activities when they have not received training in terms of training or ensuring competence as stated in the ESHRA guidelines, it's essential that training is fit for purpose and is fully recorded. This slide, which takes information from the uh, ESHRA website, shows the minimum number of procedures required to achieve certification with ESHRA as an embryologist. Now, this isn't necessarily definitive. Some people may well need more cases to demonstrate that they can work independently without full supervision. 
but it's certainly a helpful guide. The key here is that all training needs to be recorded in a suitable logbook and then can be used as evidence that a degree of competence has been built up. In their certification of clinical embryologists, ESHRA also tackles the important issue of staffing levels. And we should stress from the outset that the level of staffing within a laboratory is absolutely an issue of quality. It's clear that embryologists should not work alone. So at least two qualified, note the word qualified embryologists are recommended for labs undertaking up to 150 cases per year. The number of additional embryologists beyond that will depend on the types and numbers of treatments performed, though larger organisations may not depend solely on embryologists. So they may use technical staff, andrologists, admin support and so on. There should also be sufficient personnel to cover leave and sickness with backup options. The underpinning principle here is that patient safety and quality of care are paramount. So I'll re reiterate again that staffing levels are an essential element of quality management. The issue is not one solely tackled by ASHRA. There are uh, references to this across a number of organisations. This is just another example taken from the ASRM laboratory guidelines, and which again shows the need for a minimum of two uh, embryologists in a laboratory with increasing numbers as the workload gets heavier. It's tricky to recommend absolutely exact numbers by number of cases, egg retrieval cycles or events, since some cycles are more complex and so more time consuming than others. Just think of a standard ICSI compared with a non-obstructive azoospermia case with surgical sperm recovery on the day of egg collection. Many of us will have spent hours looking for sperm in such cases. Consider too how many more man hours might be needed with PGT cases. And as the take up of PGT and IVF centres continues on an upward trend, this adds disproportionately to the workload. This was addressed um, by Mina Alicani and colleagues back in 2014, where they looked at how extended culture, the biopsy tubing, vitrification, possible warming and rebiopsy and hatching and so on, all contribute to the demands placed on staff and facilities. And that added complexity uh, means more man hours and therefore should be reflected in the numbers of staff that are provided uh, to deliver that caseload. The next area highlighted was processes. So this is looking at standard operating procedures. So the procedures we use in the lab uh, must be supported with written standard operating procedures, and these must be version controlled, appropriately authorized, um, and um, restricted so that only current versions are allowed. Of course, the SOPs must be written so they're compliant with local standards and directives and legislation and so on. Um, and it should be completely clear exactly what the SOP covers. And in this example, you can see purpose and scope and so on. And most importantly, the lab must have procedures in place to demonstrate that everyone uses that SOP appropriately. Otherwise, any variations in outcomes from the lab can't be traced back to a particular way of doing things or a particular procedure. It's also uh, essential that the SOP, the procedure is validated, but what does that mean? The validation of the SOP should record equipment and consumables used and indicate which are most critical. So in this example of an IVF insemination, the red text indicates those having a direct impact on gametes and embryos. In our system, uh, we also listed exactly what data or information could be used to support process validation. So in this example, IVF insemination could use scientific literature, fertilization rates, polyspermy rate, cleavage rate, and any effects of timing. And our validation form had our historical data demonstrating 
that an acceptable and consistent level of performance was being achieved using that exact standard operating procedure. Even when we have tightly controlled procedures, it's possible for things to go wrong. And quality management systems incorporate a strong theme of learning from mistakes. The first thing to say is that all complaints, near misses and adverse incidents must first be recorded. Secondly, they should be addressed and any corrective actions taken. Those that corrective actions should also be recorded and disseminated. And thirdly, an annual review should be undertaken to look for recurring themes and trends so that those can then be addressed. It's important to clearly display a complaints policy and give information about how complaints can be made and how those complaints can be submitted to uh, management for the clinic. Remember, if someone has a complaint or wants to offer constructive feedback, it's a better, more productive approach to, fa to facilitate this and engage in a way that addresses the issues. Otherwise, the complainant will just head off to the nearest competitor. Incidents or adverse events can occur across all functions of the ART centre, whether administrative, communicative, processing, identification, technical or traceability, for example. Some are avoidable, some are unavoidable, um, but the ones we need to take most um, awareness of is the serious adverse events, which is any untoward occurrence associated with procurement, testing, processing, storage and distribution of tissues and cells that would lead potentially to transmission of a disease, to death or life-threatening, disabling or incapacitating incapacitating conditions for patients or which might result in or prolong hospitalization or morbidity. I guess in an IVF setting we would also um, perhaps add loss of embryos or transfer to the wrong patient. At this point it's worth reminding ourselves that to, to err is human. We're, we're fallible and mistakes can and do occur, but we must be constantly mindful of that fact. You can work out in your own system just how many times gametes and embryos are handled, moved between dishes, assessed and so on in a typical cycle. One, st one study highlighted here reported 21,500 witnessing steps across 1,757 cycles. That's an average of just over 12 witnessing steps in a normal cycle. And they used our eyewitness to calculate a potential error rate of 0.11%, which is equivalent to one possible mismatch every 900 cycles or so. Now, if you take the 2016 SART data as, as a typical example, the average number of cycles per year is around 570. So with an error rate of 0.11%, there's a potential mismatch with the wrong gametes or embryos being used every 18 months. Now, fortunately, most potential errors are corrected, but we can't be complacent. We need to think about how we control that sort of risk. Looking at the Netherlands, which publishes excellent data on errors and adverse events, there are typically a couple of events annually in which the wrong gametes or embryos are transferred back into a patient. And there is absolutely no reason to assume the systems here are any less robust than elsewhere. So we must assume that these events are happening, happening on a, a relatively uncommon but regular basis. Indeed, if we look at the collated data for across the European Union, there were 145 serious adverse events reported that involve reproductive cells or tissues in 2017. Now these occur primarily during processing, testing or storage, and they're mainly due to human error and occasionally tissue or cell defects. Now the downside of this report is not all the data reported in a consistent way. So let's look as well at a single country, the UK. The Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority requires all licensed centres to report adverse incidents and near misses within a stipulated and short time frame. And this throws up some interesting details. 
First of all, there are more incidents that relate to clinical management or administrative errors than laboratory incidents. These may be, for example, breaches of confidentiality or cases of hyperstimulation. But unfortunately, problems in the lab tend to be more, far more serious, however. Now, thankfully, the incidence of most serious events is very low. For the grade A, the worst cases in the uh, HFEA grading system, um, these were, were rare, so 0.2% of the errors were grade A in the period covering 2016-17, and none were reported in the period of 2017-18. Now, this might in part be due to the stringent requirements for witnessing laid out as a condition of licensing of an IVF laboratory in the HFEA's code of practice. And risk management is a key facet of quality management and identification of all risks and establishing ways of reducing or eliminating those risks is essential. Now, the most serious errors in IVF labs are mix-ups of gametes or embryos, so a robust chain of custody from sample procurement at egg collection or the man's sample production through to embryo transfer or storage is a minimum requirement. Now, this can be achieved by implementing a witnessing system that ensures that each time samples are moved between pots, dishes or tubes, it is witnessed and that witnessing is appropriately recorded. It's possible to do this using manual witnessing. Manual witnessing is a better system than no witnessing at all, of course, but it's still prone to errors and it's been shown to be significantly less effective than electronic systems. Simply, machines don't get bored, tired or distracted. Electronic systems can use either RFID tags or barcodes and can also introduce gateways and stopping functions that warn of a possible error. Uh, it may still be necessary to perform manual witnessing at key steps, particularly entry and exit points, the egg collection, sample collection and, and embryo transfer already mentioned. However, the added uh, reliability and reduced disturbances to co-workers being called over to witness are both crucial advantages. We'll talk about it in a moment. It's also worth highlighting that the proximity needed for manual witnessing is something we may be trying to avoid in new circumstances post-COVID-19. So does the electronic witnessing actually work? This paper by Lara Rienzi and colleagues used a failure mode and effects analysis to assess risks before and after the introduction of RI witness. The authors highlighted workload, staffing levels and disturbances such as telephones to be major causes of potential areas. And of course, uh, I think we can say that uh, many IVF labs are still prone to those issues. However, the risk of failures at vulnerable steps in the ART process were mitigated once electronic witnessing was introduced. As the authors themselves indicated, the severity of the consequences of any mistake can't be reduced, but the likelihood of an error was significantly reduced. Another element of quality management is uh, the ability to know confidently whose gametes or embryos are being handled which media, oil, plastic wear, pipettes or catheter or the likes are being used, which incubator the embryos were kept in, and when and by whom each procedure was performed. This level of traceability, and I've used the UK HFEA definition as a good example here, is essential so the impact of each part of the system can be determined and where appropriate, corrected. Now we've mentioned witnessing systems. Um, I prefer to think of them as ART management systems. So whilst they're a useful tool for error prevention, they also um, very useful potentially in traceability. By recording steps in the process, it's possible to keep an electronic record of not only who does what and when and where, but also keep information on batches of consumables uh, when and how they're used, and the levels of stock in inventory. 
That's made possible because the system relies on the lab's process map, an example here. The process map stipulates the order in which steps can be done, so the system records what step is being performed in the right order. It records in which workstation it's being used, and as it has individual logins, it records who's doing that procedure. By registering products into the system, it's possible to record what is received from suppliers, which batch is in use and which are due to be used next, and which will expire soon. All the batch numbers can then be assigned to each patient's treatment records. And because the system knows who is doing what for how long and where, the analytics can help with traceability as well as managing performance. ESHA guidelines also refer to the quality testing of consumables. In the vast majority of cases, this is addressed by the manufacturers. For example, Cooper Surgical makes its certifications and licenses public on its website and invests in state-of-the-art production facilities. This is intended to guarantee a high quality product that ensures good performance and patient safety, which you see summarized in your certificate analysis. On the flip side, please be aware that if you choose to manufacture, such as by making your own media or vitrification devices, you should really be providing a similar level of testing. This may also apply to uh, aliquoting or altering a product unless specified in the manufacturer's instructions for use. Regarding equipment, the guidelines cover uh, layout and ergonomics, but in terms of quality management, the critical considerations are that it's validated, calibrated and maintained. And importantly, that there is enough of it to facilitate the workload anticipated. Just like having enough staff, IVF labs must have enough incubators, for example. It's also important that staff know how to use the equipment they're provided with and that critical equipment is continuously monitored and alarmed. It's also worth mentioning here that quality management would require the lab to have well documented and communicated contingency plans for incidents of equipment failure. As part of the risk management, the alarms are a minimum requirement for incubated storage jurors and I would suggest media fridges. Better still, a monitoring or surveillance system is a more robust system and performs the required regular checks of equipment performance. This can be done manually, but it's much more time consuming and labor intensive. And the advantage of a monitoring system is that it will also allow you to assess performance of individual pieces of equipment, and then perhaps think about uh, how that piece of equipment is used and whether it's overused or underused and whether process and workflow can be modified to use um, the facilities provided in the most optimal way. Looking in a little bit more detail, new equipment can be subject to a user requirement specification, which sets out exactly what it should do and detail any specific issues such as size, capacity, voltage that relates specifically to where it's being used. And every piece of equipment needs to be validated, again, demonstrating that it does what it should. And you would do this typically at installation, so installation qualification IQ. You would repeat it once it's set up and operating, OQ, operating qualification, and then for a period of routine use, performance qualification PQ. This would then be reviewed periodically with an equipment qualification review or EQR. It's important to ensure that equipment is properly maintained, serviced and calibrated. And of course, this has to be recorded. And typically this um, servicing date and the likes would be uh, recorded on the instrument itself. So it's clearly visible. The EQR, the Equipment Qualification Review, um, will be updated periodically to show the instrument is still fit for purpose. Um, but further full validations would typically be performed if the instrument is repaired or modified in any way. 
We now move on to checking that what we said we would do, we do, and we do it to a good standard. Verifying conformance ensures just this and records compliance with guidelines, regulations and standards, as well as checking that one meets in-house targets. After establishing targets, it's necessary to record sufficient data to be able to confidently analyse performance and show compliance. These data are then reviewed as a team. My colleague Martin Nace will talk more about monitoring performance in the follow-up webinar tomorrow. So I'll simply say at this point that one needs to record data and analyse KPIs to judge how the lab's performing. But we can extend this to checking satisfaction of service users, looking at incidents and complaints, checking training records and perhaps monitoring research output. Of course, this can be done at various levels, groups of clinics, individual labs or indeed individual operator, whether embryologist, doctor, nurse or administrator. To understand lab performance, quality control forms a key part. This is the inspection, testing and measurement of parameters that ensure performance meets expectations. We mentioned that at the outset. And as I say, Martin will cover this, but internal quality control should be used in a way that answers particular questions about performance. So it's truly reflecting laboratory performance and not variations in the patient population, for example. Martin will speak more about it and the use of control charts as a way of, of presenting the data tomorrow. Added to IQC, the internal quality control, EQA, external quality assurance, primarily allows for interlaboratory comparisons. So this is um, a scheme that allows you to uh, submit uh, data that shows how you would make decisions, how you would assess things, and then compare it with people around the world or within the country. There are a number of schemes available for andrology and embryology. I've used one example of embryo online uh, here, but there are a number of different schemes available. Finally, we should come back to risk assessment. We've talked it, about it in a number of areas, but um, specifically it's mentioned in the ESHRA guidelines. It's important to remember it should cover all processes and all areas, and it's intended to determine the appropriate response to any risk identified. The response will depend on the type of risk, and it will depend whether it can be eliminated, reduced or managed, or indeed just accepted where no action is really possible that will reduce the risk. And I've just shown here a typical cycle and together with that, a risk assessment matrix that um, assesses the severity of something happening against the likelihood of something happening to give a, an overall score of the, the level of risk involved. And that's a fairly typical approach to um, a risk assessment. So that's an overview of quality management. Let me just very quickly summarize. We should all be striving to optimize the skills, processes and facilities at our disposal to op optimize outcomes for, for patients. To back this up and maintain quality and drive improvements, a robust system of audits and evaluation is required. And these audits can be at all levels, whether of, of people and processes. We should uh, foster a culture that encourages complaints and feedback as a learning tool, and we should use internal quality control and external quality assurance proactively to monitor and improve the way our lab performs. And finally, we should be evaluating performance at all levels of interrogation on our forms. 